Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is afternoon. It's five past 12. So for those that have been waiting patiently, uh, we won't wait what, much longer. Uh, uh, I will, let's begin this event. Um, on behalf of uh, Dean Perbellini, uh, I'm very much honored to introduce uh, Areti Markopoulou uh, today, uh, who was our first guest lecturer uh, in our series of events uh, lectures and events for fall 2020. Uh, last week we had two panel events, uh, designing architectural research, uh, a first launch for the our new two new MS programs, um, and also a NYT organized uh, event on the future of cities, uh, moderated also by our dean. Uh, Areti Markopoulou is a Greek architect, researcher, and urban technologist um, working at the intersection between architecture and digital technologies. She is the academic director at uh, IAC in Barcelona, where she also leads the uh, Advanced Architecture Group, a multi multidisciplinary research group exploring how design and science can positively impact and transform the present and future of our built spaces, the way we live and interact. Um, and her research and practice uh, focuses on redefining the architecture of cities through an ecological and technical, technological spectrum uh, combining design and biotechnologies, new materials, digital fabrication, and big data. Areti is the founder of uh, the art and tech gallery uh, Studio P52 uh, and co-editor of Urban Next, uh, a global network focused on rethinking architecture through the contemporary urban milieu. She's the project coordinator of a number of European research funded projects on topics including urban regeneration through data science, circular design and construction, and multidisciplinary educational models in the digital age. Reti has founded and currently chairs the Response of Cities International Symposium in Barcelona. And she served as a curator of several international exhibitions and her work has been featured in exhibitions worldwide. Reti is a leading researcher and educator, really. Uh, we're thrilled to have you here. Uh, in uh, in Oretti's lecture today, titled uh, Design Innovation, Resilient Cities Learning from Science, uh, she'll address how the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic crisis um, that has brought the world upside down uh, is much more than a health crisis. In Oretti's words, overcrowded cities, long distance transport, goods and people, as well as an increased number of people with respiratory weaknesses due to ambient, ambient um, uh, indoor uh, pollution, uh, have been the major carriers of the novel virus and its exponential growth. Uh, her lecture speaks to the relationship of the des of design of dense cities, their architecture, and our health. Uh, rather than just a health crisis, Areti believes that what we are experiencing today is a design crisis. Uh, in the post-COVID era, she urges city and building designers to rethink and upend many of the conventions upon which they've been formed. Her work argues for uh, design rooted in multidisciplinary science, prioritizing people's quality of life, uh, serving powerful pathways for architecture to innovate and even revolutionize, re revolutionize the discipline and therefore bring a positive impact and change to the built environment and society inhabiting it. Um, it's a pleasure and honor, uh, Reti, to have you join our New York Tech community today. Uh, to our online audience, uh, join me please in warmly welcoming Reti Markopoulou. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Tom, for the invite. Thank you very much to Dean uh, Pervellini as well, and for everybody that you are uh, here uh, with me, uh, launching uh, the online lectures of the New York Institute of Technology. Um, I saw that your topic uh, of these uh, lectures, uh, online lectures, is crisis. I know that everybody today is speaking um, about crisis, and we are, of course, in the middle of, of various crises. Um, so I will, I will um, let me start sharing my screen first. Can you all see that? Yes. Is my screen on? Okay. Yes. Thank you. 
Okay. okay, so today I would like to speak about the importance of design innovation in cities and of course the built environment. And uh, why do I believe that we need to speak about innovation in design is obviously because we are um, uh, today uh, immersed in multiple crises, uh, climate crisis, health crisis and the pandemic, social crisis and inequality economic crisis, housing crisis and lack of adequate housing for millions of people in the world, political crisis, democracy crisis, educational crisis, or even digital um, sovereignty crisis. So it seems we are experiencing multiple crises with the most recent one, this um, of the pandemic. And I would like to argue that some of these crises are in their base, as Tom said, a deep design crisis. Now let's take, for example, um, our current pandemic and compare it with the reality of our everyday living. And, and let's see if we, if we really believe that COVID-19 is, is just a health crisis. To start with, we live in a world of cities. Two out of three people will be living in cities by 2050. And we also live in overcrowded, standardized and rigid urban environments. And that's because design's answer to the growing population and the urban growth has been based on this functionalist belief of standardization and repetition. Profit that has been put above the quality of life brought uh, our contemporary cities and buildings that are based on Cartesian grids, on repetition and on standard forms, assuming that we are all standard, standardized people um, exhibiting standard, standardized needs. And we are also living in contaminated and consuming cities. These standard buildings I have just mentioned are responsible for 40% of energy consumption and 36% of CO2 emissions in the atmosphere of Europe, but also with similar numbers uh, in the rest of the world. Additionally, the built environment combined with our infrastructure and mobility patterns are also re responsible for 7 million deaths per year that are attributed to the joint effects of household and ambient pollution. 7 million deaths per year. We finally live dependent on an outdated production and consumption model. We extract resources that are not abundant. We transport them in outdated factories in order to massively produce far away from where we are to consume. Then we again transport these products to cities, we consume, and finally we produce waste. And not only do we produce a huge amount of waste, but we additionally transport back our waste far from where, from where they are produced. So this linear system of take, transport, make, use, and dispose is a system that is not sustainable, neither in economical nor in ecological terms. And of course, our current production, economic and urban models, they are based on not only in the transport of resources and products, but as well as in the transport of people. Our contemporary cities are far from the famous model uh, of 15 minute cities that so strongly is lately being defended by major European leaders, initiated in Paris by the mayor Anna Hidal. I'm not sure if you are aware of it, the 15-minute city model is based on research into how city jewelers' use of time could be reorganized to improve both living conditions and the environment. And initially developed by Carlos Moreno, the 15-minute city model, in that model, daily urban necessities are within a 15-minute reach either on foot or by bike, including work, home, entertainment, education, and healthcare, among others. And we know, we know that in most of the cities of the world today, uh, people commute for hours to reach their destination, even to go to work and, and come back. And um, this is a short introduction to contextualize the fact that the pandemic crisis that has brought the world upside down is much more than just a health crisis. The overcrowded cities or the long distance transport of goods and people, as well as the increased number of, of contamination and people with respiratory uh, weaknesses have been also major carriers of this virus during uh, the last months. Um, apart from this, um, the search for high density in cities 
uh, have created uh, also a plethora of sick buildings domestic units, buildings, or entire urban blocks that lack appropriate orientation, sun exposure, and natural ventilation, which result in an additional effect of this virus, that of mental and physical unhealth, which is driven by being confined and isolated in entirely indoor and many times uh, minute houses. So this type of built environment today, it seems to have become the norm in cities, which in turn, they are planned in ways that require both their citizens and products to commute large amounts of time via either public or private transport to get to their destination. Cities of which their economy is based on economies of scale and their production often is centralized in remote and outdated factories. So it is a design crisis. Um, the unforeseen social health related issues that our world faces today and the further probably heavier social and economic challenges that we will face through and after recovering urge city and buildings to the design of cities and buildings to rethink and shake up many of the traditions and bases upon which they operated um, in the last decades. And of course, that is not new. I mean, we really did not need a pandemic to understand our climate or our economic collapse, though we may need a pandemic uh, to take the maximum out of this crisis and to maybe start um, uh, at a zero uh, starting point. I will argue today, that, as, as my title of the, of the talk says, that rethinking design by combining it with multidisciplinary science to prioritize people's quality of life are powerful paths for architecture to innovate and therefore to bring a positive impact and change to the built environment and the society that inhabits it. And through my talk today, I will try to navigate you uh, in some examples that combine design and science in novel ways in order to achieve resiliency in cities and offer possible answers to the multiple crises that we have seen um, we are immersed in. I will show you combination of design with biology, natural sciences, material science, robotics, or data science, um, among others. So let's first start, start with what nature or the science of biology can teach us. Learning from them, architectural design can innovate, in, can innovate by redefining the built environment and cities as living organisms. Organisms that are able to filter air, self-regulate the temperature, or provide high levels of oxygen and quality ventilations. Organisms that are not, do not con contaminate through CO2 emissions or don't consume huge amounts of energy, but they produce the resources that they need and they coexist in a symbiotic way with humans and their environments. And considering the millions of deaths per year that we have mentioned before due to contamination, then architectural design has the responsibility to redefine building and city performance, driving a positive change, not only in a spatial quality, but also on the physical well-being of its inhabitants. And extracting principles of biological growth, for instance, in relation to connecting cells or to environmental conditions such as wind, sun, and humidity, we could train algorithms to simulate optimum models for entire urban planification or urban regeneration strategies. And we can then adapt these simulations to more complex and overlap necessities from land use to GDP, but also in this specific uh, case to um, sipping uh, and mobile connections, to environmental specific specificities of solar exposure, wind and comfort, in order to be able to understand the potential of renewable energy production, and of course, uh, the appropriate ventilation, um, or to specific requirements of land use, housing densities and mixed programs. So those principles could help us plan out of scratch um, our regenerating uh, or regenerate existing urban areas. Now, apart from um, uh, principles that we can extract from nature or biology, one important application of combining design with nature and technology comes with the so-called nature-based solutions. 
I, I'm not sure if you're aware of that, nature-based solution is a concept that promotes the creation, the management um, and restoration of natural or modified ecosystems, addressing societal challenges such as climate change, water and food sc uh, uh, scarcity, while simultaneously providing uh, human well-being and biodiversity benefits. Now at IAC, uh, we run a series of European funded research projects that apply nature-based solution in the different scales of the urban environment. Urbinat, which is the project that you see on your screen, is a 15 million European research grant for using nature-based solutions in the regeneration of deprived areas in three major cities in Europe, in Porto, in Portugal, in Nantes, in France, and in Sofia, uh, in Bulgaria. And part of the work uh, that we're developing for this project is based on the objective of productive cities, on the fact that the built environment could locally produce the resources their inhabitants need. One of the, the resources we are working on is, of course, energy. In this aspect, we use um, biophotovoltaic technology, which is a technology that allows us to generate energy from the microbial organism that, organisms that are generated in the roots of the plants when the plant is photosynthesizing. To simplify, if we can apply a simple system of cathode and anode um, um, in these ions in the microbial organism, we can capture um, um, these ions and generate electricity. Now, this work reveals a radical concept of using plants and living systems instead of silicon-based photovoltaic panels in order to generate renewable energy. And one of the pilot projects to be implemented is this tile-based surface for public space that you see in the image uh, that could self-illuminate during night, saving consumption on street illumination, while greening up our public spaces, protect from urban flood because plants are based on soil and soil absorbs water, and of course contribute in cleaner air with the CO2 absorption of the plants. So one single operation uh, could provide our cities and public spaces with multiple performances for resilience. And then um, some of those plants, actually, uh, they could be even uh, edible. So uh, in a way, uh, as you can see in the image, um, we can have start, we can start uh, rethinking how to produce food in our cities and how to create new forms of localization. Now, um, it's, um, uh, it's interesting to rethink uh, the way that we feed people, mainly because, um, as we know, in order to feed our population for the next decades, we need to increase food production by 70%. So we need to rethink um, uh, how we produce food and how we can bring it uh, back to the urban environment. Actually, uh, together with my colleague, Livia Calipoliti, uh, we have just been um, appointed head curators of the next Tallinn Architecture Biennale with the topic of edible or the architecture of metabolism, a proposal that is working around new forms of localization for food and new forms of circular design in, in the built environment. Now, can we imagine that our public spaces and buildings grow food, produce energy, become greener and control their microclimate without the need of sensors, actuators, Internet of Things, or any artificial cooling at all. Well, these kind of solutions are neither utopian nor speculations. They are actually deriving from pure science combined with design, or better said, um, is the outcome of creative uh, design and, and, uh, and science. Now, collaborating with expert institutions from different disciplines, such as biology, agriculture, soil science, or social science, to name a few, we have managed through these visions and solutions to generate research funds of a total of 50 million euros. And in these European grants, we are required to create consortium, and apart from designers, architects, researchers, and either scientific experts, what, what it is important is that city administrations are part of it. They are partners in these projects with the responsibility to reassure the creation of pilot projects in their cities. And through the evaluation of this pilot project, they are responsible to adapt their regulations. So this is a fundamental aspect when we are dealing with design, innovation, and experimentation. We need to be able to find ways, especially the ones that we are working in academy and research, 
to bring our research outside of our laboratories, apply it to cities, evaluate it in real context, decrease the levels of speculation. And of course, to do that, we need to make sure our research is not only relevant to our unidisciplinary peers, but to the society in its whole. And continuing with what we can learn from nature, I want to also refer to the notion of abundance. Nature, nature has abundant resources for us to consume, resources that we can grow and transform into building materials. The concrete revolution has been great in its moments, but let's not forget that concrete constructions are responsible for a huge amount of CO2 emissions in the world. And in addition to that, as a result of our current process of manufacturing and material use, it becomes obvious now that the building sector is one of the world's largest waste generators. I mean, construction and demolition waste accounts for approximately 30% of all waste that we are generating in the world. So we need to make a step further towards incorporating in our constructions, nature, um, um, natural materials uh, and abundance uh, resources. What you see actually in this picture is our Iraq forest camp, um, our Valdaura campus. It is located in a natural park uh, only 20 minutes driving from our Barcelona campus and it includes a 130 hectares of forests. And uh, one of our goals in this campus is to be able to locally generate all the resources that we need. And in terms of materials, in collaboration with the natural park, uh, forest experts or arborists, we are growing and managing our forest for locally producing timber with which we build prototypes of self-sufficient buildings. Those are some of our students dealing with um, uh, the wood that we have just extracted from our forest. Some of the prototypes that um, we are building up there, uh, you can see here, buildings made out of local, natural and zero carbon material. Timber actually is um, a negative carbon material. Since during uh, its lifetime, it has sequestrated CO2. So it's, it's not just a zero carbon material, no? Um, here are some more examples of timber uh, construction and solar houses that we have been working on the last years. But as I was saying, uh, timber is a negative uh, carbon material. Uh, we can grow it, uh, we can use it to construct uh, structurally complex buildings for a variety of contexts um, in the world. And apart from timber, within the idea of abundancy and, and following principles of circular economy, we're also working um, using urban waste streams as material resources for our need. So part of our future materials will be waste. And, and supported by another European uh, research grant, we designed buildings um, uh, solutions that use materials such as bioplastic based on organic waste or composites of biochar. I'm not sure if you are aware of what biochar is. It's basically the byproduct of the pyrolysis process of uh, the biomass. So it's burnt organic uh, matter. And um, biochar as well is negative carbon solution because it's not only um, um, uh, in, in its process does not emit CO2, but it's actually made out of CO2, no? And the interesting thing with this kind of materials is that when the lifespan of the building where they belong to, uh, it's over, those materials could go, could go back to soil and, and fertilize it. So um, it's a kind of a circular, let's say, thinking on not only where our materials are coming from, but also where they will end up after they use. Now, earth is another abundant material that nature offered to us. And for centuries, it has uh, been used for construction in vernacular architecture. But I would like to showcase how we can combine this natural abundant material with learning from other sciences, such as robotic engineering and digital manufacturing, in order to produce solutions for affordable housing in the world. So before entering in detail on, on this um, uh, project of earth-based architecture, let me do a very short uh, intro into what, from our work, we have learned from um, robotics and robotic engineering. Now, we have been working um, the last decades. Oops. Just, no, no. We have been working in the last uh, decades on the potential of robotic manufacturing and especially additive manufacturing. 
for on-site construction. On-site construction is a powerful concept for reducing the ecological and monetary costs of transporting materials and equipment on site, but it also offers the possibility of using uh, locally, uh, local material that could be sourced on site. And additive manufacturing is also uh, an interesting digital manufacturing technology, mainly because it can reduce waste uh, since there is no need of joints or molds during uh, the construction. You can actually deposit material only where you need it. So back in 2012, and uh, in the images that you see in the screen, in collaboration with Joris Larman Lab, some of our students and researchers, we have developed a technique to contour craft and print three-dimensional curves with no need of any support based uh, or printing beds. We, we call that um, printing in the air at, at that moment. Now, the interesting part of this project came when we realized actually its limitations. We are envisioning bringing such techniques on site, as you can see in the images above, and be able to create complex forms without the need of prefabricated pieces or without the need of big machines that need support layers to print. Now, um, this project soon made us realize that although the idea of printing machines on site had a big potential, at the end of the day, we were limited by the size of these machines. So in order to print big, we needed to um, uh, have machines that they were bigger than the prints. And that made us rethink our, let's say, tools um, or our robots. And, and we looked to um, robotic uh, engineering. We looked to um, swarm robotics and, and, and um, swarm robotics concepts in order to learn how we could build the tools we needed. And this is how the Mini Builders project emerged. With uh, our researchers and, and students, we were aiming at creating mobile machines that can print bigger than themselves and that can be easily transported and assembled on site to work. Again, I mean, here the material used, uh, same as in the previous case, is not natural and it's not sustainable. So in both cases, the material uh, that has been used for the prototypes um, is a combination of thermoset polymers, but more than the material, what we were actually uh, experimenting here were the tools and how we can, uh, let's say, achieve the, um, the idea of creating um, mini robots or mini machines that could come on site and, and, um, and construct. Obsessed with uh, this idea of mobile machines and robots, um, we actually um, uh, discovered that one of our partners, Technalia Company, had this um, uh, cable robots in their uh, warehouse. So they were using this cable robot to paint planes and to actually move uh, huge and uh, heavy and heavy um, packages. And when we saw the, this machine, we thought that this could be a very interesting way to hack it, transform it into a 3D printer and be able to get it on site. Because actually that structure is very easy to um, assemble as well as disassemble. And it's very easy to transport. And this is what we actually did. This is the nozzle that we have designed and created. This is the nozzle that we use for 3D printing our um, uh, earth-based architecture, our clay architecture. We have attached it uh, to the cable robot. Um, the cable robot, you can imagine that it is a very similar technology than the ones used in the stadiums when they are recording football games. Uh, so it's a, it's a very easy um, installation that could cover a huge uh, amount of a big, let's say, surface um, of, of operation. So uh, we created this uh, big 3D printer of non-fired clay. It's a machine um, um, that, as I said, uh, could be easily transported. We actually transported it in, um, um, uh, in a construction fair and, and during four, time, four days, we produced a prototype. The material with which uh, we produced this prototype, as I was saying before, is a 100% natural, recycled and recyclable uh, material. It is clay that requires no firing as traditional vernacular architecture, which also means that once uh, you build a prototype or a housing and its lifespan is over, you can reuse the material to print another structure or to use it for other, uh, let's say, products. Also, um, this material that we have developed at IAC is, is a composite of soil that could be found on sites 
um, um, combined with a series of bacteria and natural uh, additives, water-based additives to control the consistency, to control the viscosity, which is very important in the printing, and of course, to control uh, the curing time. This is um, uh, the pavilion that I told you we have constructed in three days, uh, four days, uh, sorry, during uh, a construction fair, uh, real time um, with a machine inside uh, the venue. And um, we have also used other kind of robotics, uh, not only cable robots or industrial robots, but also aerial robots um, to be able to monitor the printed structure while it was printing in order to uh, evaluate it in terms of uh, form, but also in terms of uh, curing state. So we knew at every moment, whereas we were able to deposit another layer or no, because we had real time information from the thermal scanning of, of these drones. Now, trying to bring this solution uh, to the industry, we realized that they were very surprised and they were very impressed and interested about this work, but they were whatsoever not really interested um, uh, genuinely for bringing it into the market. And, and of course, this is because sometimes industries and, and the market's priority is not sustainability or, or, or innovation or resilience, but speed, profits, and you know, the priorities that have created uh, uh, the environment that we inhabit today. But sometimes um, impact could achieve uh, not necessarily by the industry or, or, or the market, but from other institutions. And this is how we got approached uh, by UN Habitat um, in order to work with them and we're collaborating now uh, with them on designing and prototyping areas such as Africa and Asia 100% natural material based urban neighborhoods. Um, dealing with almost extreme uh, climates and offering solutions for affordable uh, passive houses. So low cost sustainable houses that are 100% recyclable, natural, that they involve the community in their design and construction and they might give solution to displaced population in the world because they could be constructed very quickly and they could be disassembled um, same quickly. Now, it's an interesting way to put digital technologies such as robots or additive manufacturing to the service of people and communities in need and reaching uh, these digital technologies and processes with people um, with a cultural background of these people, their skills um, and, and, and their craft. And although many connect uh, earth architecture with developing countries, and to be honest, this is what we're working on with um, UN Habitats, but uh, we also foresee um, these solutions in the worst part of the world, uh, radically questioning the contemporary concrete manufacturing, uh, the footprint or even the aesthetics uh, of our buildings. And I'm pretty sure that um, Gaudi would be intrigued uh, by such uh, technique and, and by such uh, aesthetical outcome, such the one that we can, we can find in the screen. So this is a proposal for Barceloneta. It's the area next to uh, Barcelona port uh, here in, in our city. Now there are more things that we can learn from material science um, and, and usefully combine it with design. Um, I will go very quickly through this uh, because I see my time is going quickly. Um, so um, some of our extended work involves not only natural materials but also synthetic materials, engineered materials, smart and active materials. Uh, in order to be able to create, for example, uh, buildings as urban infrastructures, as artificial trees that they are able to um, sequestrate uh, and filter CO2. Uh, this proposal is based on, on ion exchange uh, resin, which is a material that can absorb CO2. But also one of the most exciting parts uh, for me is the work of, 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 on, I mean, the discovery of graphene. Um, a, a super material, uh, the material of the future. It's a super capacitor. It's a very strong material. Um, uh, it's highly transparent. So it's a material that can actually allow us to create, um, um, to use the, ma the material as a sensor and create, for example, this is one of the applications that we're working with, on, with one of our PhD students, create ap applications of urban floors that they could sense people without uh, uh, invading any privacy. Um, they could sense flows and, and they could also actuate because graphene can also be an actuator apart from a sensor. So this is a 
um, a kind of a speculative video where we can see that um, a different kind of signal in cities could be powered by this, uh, let's say, um, uh, flow um, um, mapping from, from the tile. And of course, it can also become interesting, uh, relevant uh, today that we need to have the social distancing in the different public areas. Um, the important thing is that urban intelligence uh, cannot be entirely or accurately supported just by plugged in sensors and actuators, uh, but it can, it, it needs to be, um, yeah, carry on. It, it needs to, to be combined with an intelligence that comes from materiality as well. And, and be able to overlap this information with other data on our urban environments, because that gives us a powerful tool for planning and design. Um, last but not least, and, and this is the, the last, let's say, learning uh, science uh, that, um, that I will be mentioning, uh, is learning from data science and, and social sciences. Um, learning from there, architectural design and urban analytics can integrate statistical models and algorithms to predict phenomena, including epidemics or natural disasters, among others. Um, the Internet of Things, the sensor technologies and the mobile apps have actually become fundamental tools uh, during this pandemic crisis for monitoring, predicting and preventing virus outbreaks. And, and, and so can so can they do for other uh, crises as well, such as the climate one. In an accelerated digital society, there is no doubt that the data collected from the billions of devices and our digital footprints are the most precious fuel for sustainable um, engines to operate. And um, the work that we are doing uh, within data science and, and, and within uh, big data is to um, actually combine data from different sources, from open data or satellite images. And we work with this in order to analyze and reveal detailed information for different aspects of the city, different information such as land use, um, uh, contamination, uh, mobile connections, traffic density, GDP, or environmental parameters of solar exposure, wind, uh, uh, comfort, uh, humidity, etc. And um, you can see here some of the maps that we have developed for the city of Barcelona. Um, detailed cartographies and maps that help us better understand our urban uh, operation and the ways that we inhabit the urban in terms of um, uh, GDP, in terms of uh, land use, in terms of age of buildings and, and different uh, retrofitting strategies, in terms of energy consumption, in terms of waste generation or, or um, different kinds of environmental uh, parameters such as uh, solar, uh, wind, um, and, and humidity, as I was saying before. But the most interesting part comes when, you know, this kind of map is an outcome of using advanced algorithms of artificial intelligence and machine learning that allow us to cluster and identify areas not only in terms of the problematics, but also in terms of the possible solutions for relieving problems um, uh, such as contamination or intense mobility or, or excess of energy consumption, to name a few. And um, learning from data science, we are, um, and from computer science as well, we are able to create urban simulations that are not just a detailed analysis, but rather a predictive modeling machine that offers architects, urban planners, or decision makers the possibility to evaluate urban proposals in terms of their multiple impact in cities. And such processes, which are radically different from the traditional process of urban analysis, planning, and design, they are actually um, allowing a unique collaboration among decision makers and, and, and different science experts. So, Yes, um, data from sensors or satellite images and devices are useful to analyze the urban, but there is more to learn uh, if we observe and analyze the embedded intelligence in the bottom up and disorganized decisions of users in our built environments. By overlapping quantified data with qualitative data of people's desires and needs, we're actually uh, even more able to plan uh, uh, a more citizen-based um, uh, approach or more citizen-based solution for our future urban environment. 
So the next project I want to show initially questions the vast data, sometimes biased data, that are fed to the evolutionary algorithms of machine learning or AI. And it proposes an alternative model that includes small qualified data. That is the initiation of what we today call, at least at IAC, collective intelligence, an important line of research uh, in our school. And it combines big data with small data for proposing new ways of bottom-up urban planning and regeneration projects in the cities. Now, this project is learning not only from data science or computer science, but is learning as much as well from video games industry, since basically it's a video game. It's a video game for participatory urban design. It is called Super Barrio. It's an open source um, um, app. You can, download, you can download it from your Android devices. And um, although we have initially developed this project um, in-house, as, as a research in-house, we actually realized that the only way to evaluate it is to test it in, in real case studies. So um, we approached the city of Barcelona and the neighborhood association for applying it into a new pilot project uh, that is called Superblock. I guess uh, you are aware of that. It became very um, mainstream and, and um, very popular in the last year. The Superblock project is part of the Urban Mobility Plan of Barcelona, 2013 to 2018. It consists of a three by three Cerdas urban blocks in which the internal traffic is reduced to residents and all heavy traffic uh, um, circulates around the perimeter of these uh, super blocks. As you can see um, in this map with the implementation of super block, it is estimated that 77% of space is given back to people as pedestrian public space. And the first pilot superblock was implemented in Barcelona two years ago, next to our school. And it powered an immersed public disagreement, people fighting for a yes or no to a project. Um, I mean, who wouldn't want uh, extra public space anyways, no? But it happens. And speaking with the neighbor association and the neighbors themselves, we realized that they were not feeling involved in this uh, change, that they had doubts raging from the very simple question of where to park their car, uh, as to how their business would be affected. So with the Super Barrio, we decided to bring into the table a new tool for designers, citizens, and decision makers. The game invites uh, citizens to design different proposals for the new public space, allowing the same time data collection about their needs and about their desires. Now, our principal interest was to create a tool that it is a bi-directional educational model which means it's not only educate urban planners and decision makers on users' desires, but it also educates the citizens. And that's because players can have the possibility to see the impact of their decisions, the impact of their desire. Do you really want a fully green area? What would that mean for resource of water? What would that mean in terms of cost of maintenance, in terms of quality of air? Do you really need it or do you still want it? And, and how big, no? So these kind of questions were uh, actually plan of this um, uh, playing uh, process on, 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 on participatory design. And the development of the game also included a big data collection engine is one of the most important parts because the data set feeds an only online data analytic dashboard, which is able to overlap users' desires with other kinds of urban data, such as traffic, environment or even GTP, allowing the enhancement of the decision making process. And the system of real time feedback collection got the attention of many different cities in Europe. And we're now working, I mean, we have been applying that to Barcelona, Genova, Favara, we are now applying it to Porto, um, uh, Nantes and, and Genova. And um, um, we are introducing in a way um, an alternative participatory urban design process that is working with big data, but it's also taking advantage, as I was saying before, the intelligence, the qualitative data, the desires and the needs of the people. Now, closing my talk, um, I wish to share with you that in an era of rapid innovation coming from different disciplines and in an era of unprecedented challenges of our human impact in the world, design innovation and making is more vital than ever. And cross-disciplinary or cross-cultural design becomes more relevant than ever as well.
And we are urged to change the notions of materializing, managing, and constructing of our built environment. Notions of durable and consuming buildings and cities should give way to build spaces that produce, manage, and reuse, or transform resources, as well as operating in symbiosis with their users and the environment. We are also now urged to start dealing with some of our multiple crises, including the current health one as a design crisis, placing for once design, creativity and innovation in its epicenter, which is the built environment and cities. The cities and buildings we plan and build today, in turn, they shape their citizens and our society of tomorrow. And we're at a moment in our societies that design, innovation and thinking out of the box are more necessary than ever. Education too, should cross its limits beyond only envisioning towards finding ways of implementing these radical designs directly into the arena of our cities, of our built environment, and eventually in the arena of our societies. And we should ask more from architecture and design because they can give more and because they have a major role to play in an unprecedented battle for restoring our human effects and our building impact effects in a world that in its turn is also changing in unconceived speeds. So with this, um, I would like to thank you very much and open for discussion or any questions uh, from the audience. Thank you so much, Oretti. That's really a, a kind of midday inspirational lecture with wonderful- I think people. you're muted, Tom, or at least I cannot hear you. No, I'm, I'm not muted. Can you hear me now? Oh, wait a minute. No, sorry. I got my volume off because of the videos. <laughs> Oh, I have you. Thank you so much. Uh, really a, a, an inspirational midday treat um, with insights uh, uh, that really kind of span all sorts of disciplines. Um, I, I, I'll hand it over to Pablo Lorenzo Eroa uh, in a moment, who will be responding more formally uh, and moderating questions. But I'd just like to say that the, the relationship of design and science, as you describe it, between, say, biological sciences, computer science, um, data science, uh, many other kinds. Um, I understand, and I'm, I'm quite sure you, you intend this, that the precision about monitoring and generation of, um, uh, of interventions into the life processes of buildings and cities um, aims for uh, innovation uh, and inventiveness rather than uh, an understanding of science as determinism uh, and uh, kind of rehearsed processes. Uh, and that's maybe just one comment. I won't ask it as a question, but um, I'll, pa I'll introduce uh, Pablo Eroa Lorenzo, who is um, associate professor in the School of Architecture and Design uh, and the future director of the MS in Architecture and Computational Technologies. Well, uh, thank you, Tom, and thank you, Areti, for uh, uh, an amazing presentation. It's also, uh, I'm very happy, I'm, I'm part of the uh, lectures and events committee with Tom. Um, now I'm thinking that this was a perfect time for your lecture in relationship to where we are as a school. Uh, we are developing new, uh, two new MS uh, programs, one in um, architecture computational technologies that I'm going to be directing, and the other one in uh, architecture, health and design, uh, conceived by our Dean Maria Pervellini after a, a IDC grant. So I cannot tell you how great your presentation was. I mean, you presented a, a full spectrum of things uh, uh, from the EAC and from your practice and from multiple labs, right? So it's a very interesting um, presentation, uh, very synthetic and very deep at the same time because you raise uh, many important issues. To me, um, uh, and I'm, perhaps I would like to start uh, uh, this moderation by, by pointing out uh, one word that to me is essential. Uh, maybe perhaps there are multiple words you, you touch upon a, a, a big spectrum of things because we have a very ambitious program, which I love, actually, uh, uh, in our projection of the MS program in computational technology, we're thinking uh, the same way. So I'm very happy that, uh, to have you here. But one of the issues to me is responsibility. Uh, I think that the, um, uh, you raise up multiple issues that we have been seeing, right, uh, worldwide, right? We're architects that we're interested in uh, not only new technologies, but also in science, as you point out. Uh, but to me, the difference uh, between, uh, let's say, the 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s, right? There is a certain uh, uh, difference to me that is a, a structural difference. 
although you pointed, for instance, to the issue of the relation between design and science, right, which I take, I would argue that uh, what you are presenting us uh, fundamentally addresses some of the issues that were raised already in the 1970s in terms of the relation between uh, design as a personal agency versus uh, what you are presenting here, which is like design as an applied uh, science, right, as an applied scenario, right, in which in reality the designer uh, itself, right, the, the cultural agency of the designer is less important, if you want, right, than the uh, application, like the design as an application method. So that was a, a, an issue that uh, was a big issue in the 1970s, uh, split uh, architecture into two big categories, right? Uh, uh, architects that were interested in uh, uh, science, mathematics, and so on, and architects that were interested in uh, more a personalification of design uh, uh, as a cultural agenda, as a cultural agency. And I would argue that since the 2010, with the increasing of uh, AI, right, informational systems, and so on, the personalification of the designer is kind of like uh, useless at a certain point, right? Because of the amount of data that we're dealing with. So I would argue, um, I, I want to ask like this first question. Uh, can you, uh, do you agree with that? Uh, like for instance, there was a famous phrase by Diana Agrest and Gandelsonas in the 70s that they say, uh, there's an article actually about it. It says no design, architecture has no design, right? <laughs> and I would argue that you're saying design science, I agree, you said, but I would argue that perhaps the, the designer as an, as, a, as an agent is less relevant than the systems, than the designing of the systems themselves. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question, Pablo. Um, it's definitely a fundamental one. Um, it's, it's more like, um, it's a question that have also arised uh, with the um, uh, with the, um, the protagonism of the computational tools and, and the algorithms and, and the design codes. I mean, who is designing? What is the designer's role um, anyways? Um, I, I think that um, if there was uh, back um, um, uh, in the 70s, uh, um, uh, there was this, uh, let's say, dichotomy between um, design that follows science and design that follows more like uh, personalized decision, aesthetics, uh, 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 personal, let's say, expression. I think that what today we're dealing with is, is something completely different. Of course, the issue of authorship is a very important one. Um, but we are talking now not about uh, uh, a group of people that decides to um, apply uh, scientific, let's say, advancements and facts into their design, but we're talking about groups of people that they are collaboratively working together using advancements of science, no? So uh, it's, it's either now um, the star architect or the star designer versus uh, um, a collective design. And that collectivity is, is much more expanded and complex than pu putting a lot of people together. Because the, the, um, the collectivity in the design today is not only human, it's also non-human, it's of course scientific, but it's also, you know, like coming from um, the tools that we're using, that they are computational, so there is intelligence that um, um, is coming from um, uh, computers and machines, um, there is intelligence that is coming from users uh, and, and, and humans. There, is, there are biased decisions that are actually part of the design process. So you can never say that the designer is not there or is not important. I mean, uh, you cannot repeat twice the same design process if you change people. That is impossible. And this is scientifically proven as well. I mean, there is um, uh, an individual, there is a personal, um, uh, let's say, there, there is a bias always in, in certain decisions that needs to be taken uh, in this process. Um, but uh, yeah, what I would like to highlight is that today is the, 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 the important debate for me um, is this uh, collective intelligence in design that um, requires more, I mean, more than one humans, but also non-human agents. Well, in that sense, I'm glad that you raised the issue of authorship. It's a particular subject that I've been uh, researching for the last 20 years, uh, especially in relationship to computational designs. And the issue is the following, right? I totally agree with what you're saying, right? Like the relationship between the, 
uh, the collective intelligence, right? I, you know, we are, uh, you know, millions, billions of people, right, interacting. The question is what happens uh, with AI systems when uh, that collective intelligence, in a way, is very easily manipulated by one single AI, uh, you know, superseding algorithm, right? And in that sense, to me, the, the issue changes from the uh, individual designer, as you're saying, to the collective designer, right? And at the same time, uh, what's more important, like, you know, you work with simulations, I also work with simulations, a lot of people that work with simulations, the questions are the initial parameters are more important perhaps than the running of the system, right? And that took, uh, if you want, the design agency uh, from uh, a personalification to a collective, and now perhaps the uh, designing of the parameters more important than uh, than those, because in a way, uh, if you just design a simulation algorithm or a robotic swarm system, right, in a way, uh, the, the, the parameters are basically what they set the conditions that are going to emerge after, and they are like, they really supersede human intelligence by, by many, many times, right? So it's like very difficult to compete, right? Like, uh, in a way, uh, the collective intelligence, I would argue, it would be close to, uh, it's going to become closer and closer to zero, uh, irrelevant, right? In relationship to uh, AI machinic systems that are running uh, extremely fast, extremely powerful, uh, perhaps deviating, uh, obviously deviating our uh, references uh, without even ourselves knowing that, right? Uh, so the question, you raise yeah, the question the thing of that you're touching into, into topics here, it's not a question, there are almost uh, two and a half. Um, and and um, I, do, uh, I do understand your, um, your worry on, uh, on, on, on losing, uh, let's say, um, the design. Um, actually, no, I'm, I'm not worried. Eh? I've actually, I agree with you in a way. Okay. Okay. Yes, okay. Yes. No, no, well, don't, don't, okay. Don't, it's not I, your worry. It's a general worry. There is general yeah. worry that this supercomputer or this super, let's say, algorithm would actually run uh, over a lot of, of our, our, our creative, let's say, uh, design and outcomes. Okay. I seriously do not believe that. I haven't seen a computer like this. It is very difficult um, uh, to, to be able to, um, to create a machine that, uh, uh, at least today, that would be able to process all the complexity that the, that the human brain or a collective of human and hu non-human agents could, uh, let's say, um, um, process. And I also think that the major question is not whereas there will be this um, 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 this uh, artificial intelligence uh, or this, let's say, utopian or dystopian um, uh, situation of, of um, computer intelligence running over human intelligence. I think the question is, what kind of data we are feeding that artificial intelligence? And who owns those data? This is the major questions today. What kind of data? How many data? Whereas the data are biased or not? Is who is controlling the entry and, uh, and, and, and output of this data? Who owns the data and who owns the result of these processes? I think this is a much more fundamental question today because we know that data is the future oil, um, uh, but we also know that um, data, especially big data, are being used um, uh, by the people that they owe data in order to, um, to distort realities, no? Um, if you have a full power of this data or if you are able and you have the power to enter biased data, then the outcome is a controlled outcome. And therefore that is not anymore a machine that is processing the input of different, you know, like creators. That is just a, a, another machine for, for political control or for, um, 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 uh, for, for, for control of power, no? So it is, it is really um, the question that I think we should be asking and we should be making sure that uh, we always have clear before, um, uh, accepting the outcome of any work and before us entering into the process of, of, of processing uh, this work. Yes, absolutely. No, in that sense, um, to me, the issue of uh, authorship, I mean, the question is the power. I think that um, 
in what you're saying in feeding information and I agree this is surveillance capitalism that we're into right that uh, uh, in a way this in the hands of very very few people right and uh, that becomes the real issue so in that sense I wanted to raise up a question perhaps that, that interests me a lot, uh, especially with Barcelona and uh, IAC. Uh, the difference perhaps uh, in terms of what we're discussing, the difference between the US where uh, capital is given a precedence, uh, you, know, you know, everything is in function of uh, capital gain and we are seeing the consequences of that, uh, polarization and so on, right? Because it's just a matter of marketing and, and feeding uh, uh, users, right? With uh, consumption versus Europe, uh, but also Europe, uh, in terms of what you're saying, you know, you, you touch upon very interesting things, which is a 15 minute city, uh, which is actually in, an interest uh, raised by the government also, right? The government is not alien to these decisions, right? Uh, the fact that you, uh, with the EAC, you are doing applied research as prototypes, and then those prototypes uh, perhaps are able to change and transform the, um, you know, regulations in the city, which to me is, uh, is you know, what we are all aiming for. And uh, perhaps the difference with Asia, right? That is more focused on development now. So I'm very interested in the, in the different uh, political, if you want, political, economical, uh, in terms of responsibility, uh, both in terms of where Europe used to be relative to technology. Sometimes it was claimed to be slow in terms of technology. Now I think that it's a very different type of Europe. Uh, your program, uh, the IDC in Stuttgart, right? Uh, the Bartlett, right? Uh, or the AA, right? There's very interesting, uh, if you want uh, uh, positions about that relationship. And I would argue the IAC in Barcelona was able to really uh, put some points in the city and uh, make a difference. I actually visit some of the buildings that are amazing, they're very key positions. So can you explain maybe perhaps a little bit uh, that relationship, like how do you feel Europe is, where is going in terms of all these things? Yeah, I mean, I want to, to say that, first of all, that the digital, um, could be a powerful tool for um, um, for changes uh, that could have a positive impact as well as it can be a powerful weapon for distraction, right? Uh, political regimes are, 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 are of course related with how the use of digital um, uh, becomes um, uh, relevant and applied into the everyday life of, 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 of of us all, of our societies. Uh, I mean, in the crisis, as you, uh, as you have seen, I have included the digital sovereignty crisis. It is a crisis because countries now, Europe especially, um, um, is interested into um, having a step towards more, uh, having a step towards uh, in a more uh, innovative way of dealing with the digital rather than inventing digital, no? And, and I think that um, this is also something very important. I mean, in our society, in our contemporary society, we need to have different roles. We need to have this kind of critical thinking of how the digital um, uh, could be democratized or, or, or how it could uh, eventually become a, 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 a destructive uh, weapon um, for, you know, like um, um, expanding even more the inequalities that we are experiencing in our societies today. So that is what Europe is working now with really interesting um, and, and um, innovative uh, actions, projects like the Gaia, um, and a couple of more that I, I, I can't remember now the name, but I can share it with you. There are initiatives that they are, they are trying to really democratize the digital, to, 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 to create the protocols that they were not there on, on how to, um, to protect the citizens. You know, when the whole smart city became mainstream, actually the ones that they were dealing and, 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 and they were um, having the power, there was, the, there was the telecommunication companies, Google and Cisco and, and Facebook lately, they came to cities and they made agreements to implement devices and to, to be able to become the eyes of the city. And, and, and at that moment, nobody was really uh, asking who owns, you know, this information. And, and uh, cities, European, but also, um, 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 not all non-European cities, they were accelerating to be first or from the first cities that they were implementing these innovations, but they didn't know what kind of, of uh, you know, like uh, impact it could have. And I think this always happens with um, 
uh, with novelties. Uh, unless you start to, uh, to, to practice it and unless you start to apply it, you, you, you cannot really evaluate it in its totality. And you can never, uh, from the very beginning, define which are the protocols that you need to define so that everything would operate in, in the best way. No? So this is what happened. At some moment, everybody was found with contracts, especially cities with contracts with telecommunication companies that they were actually giving everything away. And they basically said, okay, wait a minute, let's sit down because it's not only what they have now, it's also what they will have um, uh, in the close future. And it's also how we need to deal with the information that we have in the cloud and in the digital and um, um, in, in, in the digital footprint, let's say, of our societies. So Europe is, is, uh, is, is focused on that now. And I think uh, it's interesting what you, you, are, you are comparing with um, um, Asia, for instance, that uh, on the contrary, they are fully investing into developing uh, technology, fully investing into um, leading uh, the digital, uh, without any preoccupation at the moment of how this digital could become um, uh, more socially, let's say, um, accessible or... Yeah, or, exactly. or yeah, it's a, well, it's a different type of... Hope. But uh, I, I'm glad that you mentioned that up. But at this, I mean, the reason why I was asking that question, and perhaps this is my last comment, and then we open to the uh, public, uh, is the, the fact that you, uh, you know, I'm also interested in uh, designing technologies, right? Uh, you guys develop a, a cable-driven 3D printer, right? Which I also happen to have a, a, a patent growing in that, in that aspect. You de develop a, a, a printer that uh, takes the local soil, right? Which is a very interesting thing that other universities working on similar issues. So you, you also would agree, I guess, with me, you're developing a video game, right? You, agree, you would agree that you're on the necessity of developing, design developing uh, uh, tools as well, right? Software tools uh, and, and the mechanism. So it's not only when you're saying Europe is, uh, perhaps the role of Europe is in um, in applying the, the development of like perhaps Asia more out the foreground. I would also argue that in Europe, there's a very interesting bottom up because it's like uh, artisans working in a very different way, uh, hacking robots, right? Or for instance, you know, like in the nineties, it was example of Ferrari, you know, uh, going to develop a piston in a, in a, with somebody in the middle of a mountain, in the middle of nowhere, right? Or, uh, or the lenses for the telescopes, right? Uh, and I, I think that, would you agree with me that uh, you, you- You are totally you, right. And I think that the most interesting thing is that Europe is investing on that, right? Exactly. So Europe is investing on these bottom-up um, uh, practices and these uh, bottom-up initiatives and, and this, uh, new um, um, entrepreneurs and, and startups that they are working with us. Um, they are investing in a very interestingly democratic way, for example, also because as I was saying, we are very much involved with the European grants and even the topics of the grants that they are selecting, they are selecting it with a very, very open process. Um, so they are willing and eager to understand what is relevant and what is necessary um, but at the same time, as I was saying, there is not a very clear plan into dominating the, yeah. the um, technology, let's say, evolution in that sense. They are also interested in protecting the population, which it doesn't happen in Asia and in the United States. Well, thank you uh, for the answers. I really loved your presentation. I think it's uh, terrific. But now we open to the public. Uh, Tom, um, uh, uh, thank you for the introduction. It was a great uh, uh, discussion. So I, I wonder if somebody in the public here would like to raise a question. Just, I just think to answer to a question that I see on the chat uh, about the Super Barrio. Yes, yeah. it is. Uh, uh, the Super Barrio is available and you can download it, but only for the cities that we have developed it for. No, so for the moment you can find it for Barcelona, Porto, and and Nantes. And um, by the end of the month, you will also find it for Sofia, but there is no US one yet. So if somebody wants to, I think that you're automatically muted or you can unmute yourself. But if you ask in the chat, uh, we can give you the, or you can um, try to unmute. Uh, faculty as well, right? We have faculty from our School of Architecture. Uh, there is a question here by Kevin. You, um, Let's see if I can unmute you. Well, I can't because I'm not the co-host. Uh, maybe, 
Uh, Susan, can you unmute Kelly? Kevin? Yeah, I think Kevin is... Kevin, do you want to, to say your question live? I mean, it is in the chat. You are unmute now, so you can Sorry, speak. Sorry, I, I, I'm looking, you said Katie? I, Kevin, I, Kevin. Kevin. Oh, Kevin, oh, sorry. Yes, hold on. I will unmute I think, you. Well, Kevin is unmuted now, so I think yeah, he is. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Sorry about that, yeah. I guess my question was just, how do you take all this really cool innovation and new technology and then make it, um, you know, at a price point where it becomes readily adoptable and becomes the go-to method of doing things. Um, is that just a matter of, you know, increased production, increased time to make the cost curve come down and then eventually it'll be that way? Or are there intentional things you can be doing, you know, while making design decisions so that, you know, the, the necessary innovations that we have become the new normal when it comes to a building technique or, you know, a city planning or something like that? Yeah, well, um, the first thing I, I would like, uh, thank you for your question, is, is, is really a critical one. So the first thing I want to share with you is that our main goal is to make people listen, right? So our main goal is not to massively produce a technology or to massively, let's say, or, or, or patent and massively um, um, uh, bring into the market a certain um, innovation. Our first goal is to make people listen. And the only way that people would listen into uh, innovative ideas, into radical ideas, experimental ones that they haven't been tested before, the only way is through pilot projects. So our, our, our goal is to always try, as I was saying in my talk, to take out of our lab, you cannot imagine the amount of exceptional work that we have in our laboratories. It stays there, it dies there exceptional amount of work but then we try from this huge amount of work to select or to to push as much as possible um, to initiatives um, and actions such as participating into European grants as I was saying no it requires the creation of consortiums with cities cities are then um, uh, bonded to apply this into pilot projects uh, so actions that uh, bring outside of the lab um, um, these uh, ideas is, is uh, something that we're working on and we're trying to create pilot projects as much as possible, you know. Of course, um, it's much easier to, to, to pilot a, a small device or a small tile and it's much more difficult to pilot, you know, like a, an, an urban regeneration solution, right? So uh, in the different uh, levels, let's say, of the work that we are developing, we're trying to find the most appropriate um, uh, ways. Now, um, yes, we have been found ourselves many times with the industry asking us to adapt what we have in order for them to, um, to be able to, you know, like lower the price and make it uh, competitive and everything. Um, one of our projects, for example, with Acciona, it was um, a few years ago, um, a 3D printed pedestrian bridge. Um, that was a collaboration where we, we were very much wanted to innovate with a lot of different uh, uh, proposals that were accepted. But then at the moment that the project was decided to be built in a public park, uh, in a public space, then... Um, um, most, most of these, uh, let's say, novelties were discarded uh, due to regulations, due to limitations, due to the, you know, like uh, all the worries that uh, both industry have, but also administration have when it, ha when it comes to the construction sector. It is a very, very slow sector to innovate. And of course, on the one hand, one could, not, could understand why. I mean, it deals with safety of people and it deals with, um, 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 with complex, let's say, matters. On the other hand, it's, it's also the one that could radically change the way that we live in terms of quality of life and also the impact in the environment. So it's, it's really a crucial sector, the construction sector. It needs to, to open up to innovation and that sometimes means that um, the novel solution is it's, it's not the most competitive of all yeah perfect question um thank you is, is there anybody 
uh, wanted to raise a question. Um, I don't see here in the chat, but uh, please feel free. Hi, Pablo. Hi. Yes, Hi, yeah. Hi. Thank Thank you. Ariel. It was great. To, it's great to thank you for such an inspiring lecture. And uh, this is perfect midday for us. And uh, and really all the you know projections about the current and the future conditions. I think uh, you touch on so many layers and topics for discussion that maybe you know. We're going to have another lecture, <laughs> but I think it starts to raise a lot of topics that are all, I think, uh, related to each other. So I think to me, one interesting reflection is that a uh, relational approach to system at the global scale has changed. And in particular, I think the link between uh, the economic, the ecological viability, public health system and the public realm, which I think is very important, you know, as we begin to project all of these inter you know, interrelated systems. And all of this, of course, you know, within the kind of technological paradigm. So um, I think the connection of the system would, and I think it's already happening in a way, surpass what we call nationalism, right? So really the definition of the cities, the nation state, uh, and really on behalf of the coordination of how we can share system and approaches. And I think all of this is really changing geopolitics. And I think that's very, very important as a key point, I think, if you look at uh, the connection of all these layers. So I think there is also, you know, when we look at all the system, the need to introduce the planetary as a concept. And, uh, and I think it's very important to see the integration of all scale, uh, looking at the world as an architectural project. You know, I think if we look at the latest book by uh, Ashim Sarkis, he's really talking about the, the, uh, the architecture uh, the architectural project, the, the world as an architectural project, really imagining the future of the planet through world scale project. And I think uh, uh, that is an important framework. So really looking at world scale projects that begin to look at the, uh, all of the, the interrelation of all these layers from, uh, from a planetary level. And I think these are very important because they're actually opportunities for us to rethink how we redefine the fundamentals of living. And I think the pandemic is really questioning that. So to get to the question, so how do you see the shift uh, of urban forms, particularly within the paradigm of the planetary frame to technology, but not only a technology as, uh, again, deterministic approach, but more importantly as enabling technologies? Because I think that's also, you know, what some of the projects that you uh, talked about, it really talks about the technology as enabling tools for uh, looking at the looking at the planetary scale and world scale projects that start to address larger issues. Thank you, Marcella. Um, yeah, your intro into the whole uh, geopolitical aspect of what is happening is, I think, um, very relevant. Um, it's, it's definitely a moment uh, that could uh, power a much more relevant and essential um, discussion and perception of, of how, how the idea of borders uh, or the idea of nations are being perceived, um, how the idea of common and the collective is also, uh, let's say, built uh, from the bottom up. And, and of course, how the different experts come together from fields of uh, yeah, economy, ecology, biology, sociology, uh, um, anthropology, um, 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 health and medicine, how they could come together into decisions that they are beyond physical borders, no? I'm really looking forward to that discussion. I'm really looking forward to see certain actions in relation to that, because unfortunately, what we've seen during the pandemic, it was almost the opposite, right? It was the complete opposite. Um, decisions that they were uh, basically um, uh, had uh, no very clear logic and it was, they were limited into national borders. Um, there were no uh, a very uh, serious consensus among uh, uh, countries and experts. Um, it, was, it was really not, I mean, there was an opportunity there and I can't somehow feel that it was lost, no? Of course, though, um, all this um, globalization is, is, is changing the way that we inhabit, you know, our spaces. We are now um, um, hyper-connected from different parts of the world beyond any physical proximity. We were before as well, but now it's much more like an everyday uh, part of our life. We, we are doing, our life is a hybrid model, no? I'm, uh, I'm saying that 
I act that we are pre preparing a, a hybrid model of education, but our life is also hybrid. It used to be hybrid, it's now even more hybrid than before. The digital is becoming as part of an, an extension, let's say, of our body, our work, our decisions, our interactions. And, and, um, and of course, um, that questions uh, the perception of, of, um, of the private, questions the perception of the public, um, um, and, and, and it opens up uh, poss possibilities, new possibilities of how to inhabit the urban, as you say, you know, I know that your question is on the urban forms and, and the evolution, I would say, of the urban forms. Um, the digital until now already had expanded the way that we, that we occupy and we inhabit the urban, like the way that we navigate, for instance, in the urban environment has radically changing from the moment that we're using GPS. No, it's like a radically different way. I see apps here in Barcelona, but also in other cities of the world that they have emerged in order to, um, to be able to take routes in the city that they are uh, the furthest away from uh, areas with um, high numbers of infections. Um, we have been working some time ago in an app where you would have the possibility to um, to go from home to work or from point A to point B, selecting according to your mood, whereas you wanted to go through shadowed, exposed to sun areas, uh, vegetation, quality of air. So um, I kind of see technology as an enabling tool there in order of, of, um, of augmenting the knowledge and the connection that we have with that space, no? Um, we are able and we will be able to know much more about what we cannot see, not only what we can see. Uh, information and, and, and data on what we cannot see in terms of, uh, you know, particles and, and contamination and, and uh, you know, like amounts of oxygen and all these kind of, of things that I think would be really, really interesting um, on, on, on how we inhabit individually and how we serve this uh, uh, globally in, in, in remote areas, because we will continue to be connected, as I was saying before, beyond physical proximity. Uh, there is uh, another question. I'm glad that, Marcella, you raised that up, because uh, I think that we are past due the time of individual recycling, while the entire world is not coordinated in terms of that. So the pandemic, I'm, I totally agree, Areti, uh, that brought that up, right? That individual and uh, local decisions cannot uh, happen any longer, but we need a global coordination. There is one, one question by Harith. Uh, uh, Susan, I don't know if you want to unmute. Can you unmute uh, Harith? That is in relationship, it's a very interesting question in relationship already to your 3D printer. Um, it's here in the chat. Yes, Harith? Good evening, Good evening everyone. I want to ask about uh, how can we use the 3D printing materials in the large scales building? Uh, it's uh, have to be uh, constructions uh, uh, specific uh, kinds and uh, what you can to uh, use to construct mega uh, space and uh, the environment interior environment uh, needs. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I, I completely um, uh, heard uh, your question, but. Um, I, I, I would say that first of all, um, the answer has to do with, depends on what kind of 3D printing and what mm. kind uh, of materials you're using. Yes, if, you're talking, if you're asking about our projects, um, the major, let's say, work uh, on 3D printing is related with earth-based uh, um, uh, printing, with clay printing, and, and, and that's, uh, we, we, we did, we did, uh, um, concrete printing, uh, as I said, um, um, structure in collaboration with, um, with Axiona, but our main goal is the 3D printing with clay. So how can you scale up? If that is the question, then um, I say that um, um, there are two ways to scale up. One, and, and this, this also is a very important discussion today is whereas you are on site or whereas you are off site, whereas you are on site constructing or whereas you are prefabricating. And they are both valid. I am more um, in front of the on site for various reasons, but they are both valid in terms of, um, uh, let's say um, optimization, in terms of sustainability, in terms of savings in, 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 in both um, economic, but also environmental costs. So um, you can scale up by 
prefabricating elements um, uh, and, and, and assemble them on site. And, and you can scale up uh, with um, uh, what I always say that is interesting is the idea of, of creating these uh, pop-up factories very close to the sites um, um, that they are questioning the current, let's say, production factory lines and plants, but they are also allowing for a combination of, of, cons of construction on site, printing on site, but also prefabrication mainly because it's highly difficult that the entire building is made out of one material. It's very difficult because let's say in our, in our clay printed structures, we need to have certain uh, openings and, 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 and windows. And we need to have, even if, you, if we have results as, at certain point, the structural performance, we need to have other kind of elements uh, that would complete the architecture. So I think that um, this is something that could happen with a combination of on-site and, 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 and prefab, but very close to the site, no? the, the pop-up factory is what I call them. Thank Did you I answer the question? Yes, I think it was it's a great answer. So Tom, you want to make the closing word? Yeah. Sure. Thank sure. you, Areti, so much for the presentation okay. and the questions. Thank you really so much, uh, Areti, for your lecture and, and, and the great fielding of questions. This is, I'd, I'd love this to go on forever. Our students and many others joining us, it's the middle of the day for us here. Um, I am particularly find it uh, uh, inspiring to kind of hear about notions of scientific discipline, of methods, uh, and uh, discourses brought to uh, design. Um, uh, with respect to how you've described through a series of projects, the unpredictability and uncertainty of cities. Uh, to me, this has been really a fundamental aspect of my own research. And I think for our students and, and, and guests here today, uh, this is really quite a, a, a treat to kind of hear such high level, uh, presenta high level presentation of your projects, uh, research um, and the discourse surrounding it uh, in a really uh, challenging time uh, where you frame it as design crises, but yes, there are crises of really all sorts. So thank you very much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you very much for the invite, Tom uh, and Pablo. Uh, it, it's nice to see the face of everybody. So yeah, uh, I hope we can meet um, soon physically. And I would have the possibility to visit the school. Um, until then, uh, good luck with everything. And, and thank you very much for your engagement. Thank you very much, Aditi. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.